Welcome to Forest Brook. We are a community of Jesus followers who believe in Jesus' power to transform lives and the call of the local church to be a part of that. Together, we're exploring what that looks like today in our many shifting contexts where we live and work and go to school and play. So welcome to our online space. You are welcome here. And if you're new to us, please take a moment to fill in a digital welcome card at forestbrook.ca so that we can get to know a little bit more about you. So today is the last day in our series, Soul Care. And this is the last Sunday before summer starts at Forest Brook. So we wanna make sure that you know what's happening this summer at Forest Brook. You can find all of that at forestbrook.ca forward slash summer. We'll be exploring how God is calling us to greater connectedness to one another and to Him in big and small ways. We'll be making some changes to our online gatherings for the summer months. We'll be still here every week, of course, but we're simplifying this time together and then inviting you to connect with our church family on Zoom every week for communion and just being together. So please make sure to check that out. We are excited for all this summer will bring. And today, as we close our soul care series, we'll look at the soul's destiny. I had a funny moment this week where suddenly I was thinking about Christmas. Weird, right? There's a familiar song and verse that talks about the soul just a little before Jesus was born. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's Mary. After she's told by the angel that she is going to be the earthly mom of God's own son, remember what she says? My soul glorifies the Lord, magnifies the Lord, praises the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. When I think of the destiny or the ultimate purpose and reason for our souls, I think Mary's got it right here. So just for a minute, Come with me in this Christmas scene. Let's join Mary in her anticipation of Jesus, her faithfulness and her courage, and the way her soul worships her God. My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to all those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down the rulers from their thrones. But he has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised. Hi, we are back again with one final verse to introduce to you. However, we hope that this has encouraged you to look deeper into and remember the verses for longer. There are some wonderful YouTube accounts which focus just on signing Bible verses or songs which might be really meaningful to you. You can discover all sorts of vocabulary which will be helpful for you to enjoy the Word of God. And with each new word, you then learn that you're discovering more and more verses which you will simply be able to speak in your American Sign Language. And for those of you who've, who are already fluent in this language, thank you for being patient with those of us who are just learning. For today, we want to leave you with a verse that encourages praise to God. Isaiah 61 verse 10. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in God, for He has clothed me with the garments of salvation and arrayed me with a robe of His righteousness. So let's get to this. So we're using a number of signs this week again that we've already learned, which will be helpful because they should already be in your muscle memory. So the first phrase of the verse is, I delight greatly in the Lord. I, you already know, it's I coming out of your heart. 
Delight is taking your left hand and bubbling it over your heart. Greatly is two hands up, like, oh yeah, that's great. So I delight greatly in, take a hand that's kind of in like an L shape or a toaster and you put the toast in the toaster. In the Lord, we already know Lord, it's L from shoulder to hip. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices. We know soul and we know my. My, you put your hand on your chest. Soul is that circling smoke going up. Rejoice, I really like this one. So you're gonna take your little J fingers, this is how you do the letter J, and they're gonna bubble over your heart. Rejoice. My soul rejoices in, toast in the toaster, my God. For he has clothed. So four, we're gonna take our hands, go flip them up off your forehead. I actually think that might be okay. He has clothed. We're gonna push down our clothes without touching them. Me with garments, same sign again, of salvation. So you're gonna take the S hands, which is the palm closed and the thumb over your fingers. That's the letter S. We're gonna cross. And if you're a baseball fan, it's just like safe. And you're safe at the plate. Garments of salvation. So, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. And arrayed, arrayed is clothe and celebrate because they're kind of fancy clothes. So clothe and celebrate as two fingers going up and celebrating. Me in a robe, same as clothed, of his righteousness. So you're gonna take the R hand, which is crisscross fingers, and you're gonna wipe your arm clean because you are righteous. So the whole verse all together. Okay. A lot of words <laughs> and a lot of words that repeat. Okay. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in robes of his righteousness.
God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far away from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love. Heal and forgive. He bled and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know Yes, I know He holds the future And life is worth the living just because He lives
Good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you this morning. Before I begin, I'd like to say thank you for all of your thoughts and prayers during my recent illness. I'm feeling much better and slowly getting my strength back. I believe your prayers made a difference and I'm grateful for God's healing touch on my body. So thank you for praying for my recovery. I really do appreciate it. Today is the last in our short series on soul care. We've learned that each of us has a soul, that God-given inner part of ourselves that is meant to govern our thoughts, decisions, and our actions in all of life. We've learned that our lives are meant to be shared with God, and that it's at the soul level where we and the Holy Spirit live together. We've learned that religion tends to tell us that we become better people by believing and doing the right things. But that can tend to be an outside-in approach to transformation. A bad tree trying to bear good fruit. But genuine spirituality tells us that it is by caring for our souls, tending to our innermost being in partnership with the Holy Spirit, that we are transformed. It's an inside-out approach, becoming a good tree that will naturally bear good fruit. We've looked at some practical ways that we can care for our souls. We've talked about walking with God, just spending time alone with Him so that we can listen for His voice within us. Brian Carney talked to us about the benefit of keeping Sabbath, a reordering of our use of time, particularly on one day each week, with a focus on our relationship with God and with others. Last week, Paul talked to us about prayer, the most basic and intimate way that we share our lives with God and allow Him to have a place in our day-to-day -day lives. These are just a few of the ways that we can nurture our souls in healthy ways ways that open them up to a deeper fellowship and communion with God in our innermost being. There are many other ways that we can care for our souls. And if you'd like to read more on this subject, I recommend again John Ortberg's 2014 book, Soul Keeping. There's a lot more there on how we can understand and care for this most important part of ourselves. So I want to finish this series off today by having us think about God's plan for our souls. After all, each of us has been created by God. He's the one who has given us life, who breathed into our flesh the breath of life, making us living souls. I want us to realize today that life isn't random. God's creation is intentional, and your life has meaning and purpose. And God is pretty clear about that in what we have written in the Bible. Let's start in Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 25. Then Jesus said to them all, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, but those who lose their life for my sake will save it. Okay, first let's put this thought in its context. Earlier in this passage, in verse 21, Jesus has been talking with his disciples about how the Son of Man, that's Jesus, would need to suffer, be rejected, and die in order to fulfill his mission. He's preparing his disciples for the fact that if his path required suffering, then they should also be prepared for that to be their experience as his followers. In the verse we just read, there's a play on words going on. Jesus says, if any of his followers want to save their lives, and here he means play it safe, avoid danger and suffering, then they would actually end up losing their lives, meaning rendering them useless or setting them aside entirely. But if a Christ follower is willing to embrace suffering as part of their path, if they're willing to lose their lives, then they will actually save them. 
What Jesus is talking about here is what we often refer to as the cost of discipleship. Jesus says that those who follow him must be prepared to suffer as well. He says if you choose to play it safe in order to avoid suffering, you lose more than you gain. But if you embrace suffering as a follower of Jesus, then your life is actually going to be preserved and restored. That brings us to verse 25, which says, For what does it profit someone if they gain the whole world but lose or forfeit their very selves? This is the verse that I want us to think about today. Some translations say, what does it profit if someone gains the whole world and loses their soul? The principle here is all about our approach to life. If our lives are all about gaining as much from this world that we possibly can at any cost, then we're likely doing great damage to our innermost being, our souls. The original word for losing oneself meant to debase or lower oneself. Expositor's Greek New Testament calls it the vulgarizing of the soul. Life is not meant to be lived from the outside in. Your and my life is not meant to be all about the pursuit of worldly gain. It's not about satisfying the desires of the flesh, chasing after all the worldly good that we are so often convinced life is all about. We won't find ultimate fulfillment and satisfaction by gathering up to ourselves all of the worldly success that we can grab hold of. All of that does not make for a fulfilled soul. We're actually created with the inherent need to care for the soul first, and all those other things will follow as they're meant to. Notice what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I love this chapter in the Bible. I think it's become my favorite chapter in all of Scripture. I think that if all of we had of the Bible were these 21 verses, it would still be enough for us to figure out the meaning and purpose of human life. There's that much packed in here. Here's what Paul wrote in verses 1 to 10. Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. The tent Paul is referring to here is our human body, which is mortal. It can be destroyed, and quickly too. I know from my recent illness how quickly someone can lose their health and vitality. Within a matter of 48 hours, I lost all of my strength so that I couldn't even sit in a chair. I could only lie on the floor. But Paul is saying that this earthly body isn't our only body. God has in store for each of us a new heavenly body, not a temporary one like a tent, but a permanent one like a building, a new resurrection body kept in heaven for each of us. Paul continues, Meanwhile we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, because when we're clothed, we'll not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we don't wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. What an incredibly hopeful passage this is. Verse 5. Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose and has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we're always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due them for the things done well in the body, whether good or bad. Paul is saying that this is the nature of our creation, 
This is how God has made each of us. It's his design and his purpose. We are living souls, but within these human bodies. But these bodies are temporary, like tents. We are made for more permanent bodies, buildings kept in heaven for us. This is the very nature of our eternal creation. But notice two other things that Paul says in this regard. He says that each one of us is accountable for how we live this life that we've been given. Each one of us will one day stand before Jesus to answer for how we lived our lives in this earthly body. It is the soul that will be on trial here. It is the soul that was created and intended to be the master of the human life in the flesh. And it is the soul that will one day have to give an account for that. But here's the thing. The idea of a final judgment can be intimidating or even scary, but it isn't meant to be, and it shouldn't be. Remember that a human life is meant to be a shared experience, our souls united with the Holy Spirit. What did Paul say in this passage? He affirmed that the way we exist in these bodies is by God's design. It is the way God has made us. So Paul says that because we understand this, we seek to please God in how we live our lives. This is also God's intention. Our lives are meant to be shared with him. And when they are, we can expect not condemnation when we stand before Jesus to give our account, but celebration. With the Holy Spirit as our advocate, it is not our failing and our shortcomings that will be the focus of this judgment. It will be our growth and our successes enabled by the Holy Spirit. That will be the focus. This is what God has intended for each of us. This is how the human life is meant to be lived. In the rest of this chapter, Paul goes on to talk about how we live this reality out. He goes on to say that since this is God's design, since this is how we are created, let us go on to live as ambassadors for Christ, sharing in his ministry of reconciliation of all things. It is the most amazing, fulfilling, and hope-filled view of the meaning and purpose of human life that we can find in all of the Bible. And it's true. This is what you and I have been created for. So how do we live it out then? How do we, at the soul level, live with an intentionality that pleases God? This is where those practices that we've been talking about come in. These are the practical ways in which we tend to our soul first, so that from our innermost being, we are able to guide our thoughts, decisions, and actions in ways that honor our creation and fulfill our meaning and purpose as God's children and followers of Jesus. The practice I want to highlight today is one of the very best for interrupting the pull of this world, the pull that it has on us to conform to its pattern of success against what is best for our souls. It is the practice of generosity. Nothing displaces the self as the center of your universe quite like the practice of generosity. Let's take a look at what I mean. We're looking at Luke chapter 11, verses 37 to 41. The translation of this passage is a little tricky, and different versions of the Bible word it differently. But let's take the New Living Translation here, as I think it's the one which makes this word picture the most easy for us to understand. As Jesus was speaking, one of the Pharisees invited him home for a meal. So he went in and took his place at the table. His host was amazed to see that he sat down to eat without first performing the ceremonial washing required by Jewish custom. Then the Lord said to him, You Pharisees are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside, you're still filthy, full of greed and wickedness, fools. Didn't God make the inside as well as the outside? 
So give to the needy what you greedily possess, and you'll be clean all over. Okay, that's quite a rebuke. But in this, we have all of the elements that we've been talking about in this series. These Pharisees were very religious. They believed the right things. They did the right customs and practices. But what was going on in their souls? They were still greedy and self-serving. They were living the religious life from the outside in. So Jesus calls them to account. He tells them that God made the interior life as well, that part of themselves that they've been ignoring. He tells them to address that and everything else will fall into place. Remember the good tree analogy. A bad tree cannot bear good fruit. So the goal is to become a good tree and good fruit will naturally follow. And notice that this particular practice that Jesus prescribes for them to change in their souls is for them to go from greed to giving. Another translation of this puts it this way, be generous to the poor and everything will be clean for you. The act of generosity, especially generosity motivated by empathy and compassion, removes self from the center of the soul. It makes space for the Spirit of God at the very center of who we are. And when the Holy Spirit is at the center of our soul life, our thoughts, decisions, and actions will all fall in line with His will for our lives. Let's look at one more passage in this regard. 1 Timothy 6, verses 17 to 19. The Bible has a lot to say about generosity. It's the hallmark of the life of every Christ follower because it is so much the heart of God. Notice what we have here in 1 Timothy. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to be good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. I hope we listened to that whole passage as I read it. First of all, it's addressed to those who are rich in this present world. Let me say that by today's global standards, that's pretty much every one of us. And I'll add that those who are very well off by this world's standards that I know are already among the most generous and compassionate people that I know of. Many are blessed because of their generosity. So I want us to hear this passage in the first person, each of us, because the principle here applies to every one of us. Again, here Paul contrasts two approaches to the life that we live in this world. One is to put our hope in our material possessions, what we've stored up for ourselves or gained for ourselves in this world. The other is to live in a way that pleases God, putting trust in Him for everything. And I love what Paul puts at the end of this exhortation. It so fits with what we've been talking about. He says that by practicing generosity, we take hold of life that is truly life. That's soul language. That's a way of living that cares for the soul and deepens it in the heart of God. In his book, John Ortberg says this about a deep soul. A soul that has depth when it's connected to God. A deep soul has the capacity to understand and empathize with other people, not just itself. A deep soul notices and questions and doesn't simply go through the motions. A deep soul lives in conscious awareness of eternity, not simply today. That's what these past four weeks have been all about. They've been a reminder of our need for soul care 
and for you and I to live our lives in ways that flow out of a deep soul life. We've been reminded over and over again that each of us has been created by God to live a life shared with him, that our lives have meaning and purpose, and that the best way to live a life that is pleasing to God is to tend to the soul first, to make room for God in our innermost being, to be a good tree from which good fruit can only naturally flow. This is what we are. This is who we are. You are a living soul inside this earthly tent at this time. You will stand before Jesus and give an account for your life. And then in the resurrection, you will receive a new, glorious, and permanent body. This is God's intention for you and for me. How then should we live? As Paul said, Wherever we find ourselves on this plane of existence, our goal is the same, to please God in everything we do. There is much more that could be said about the soul and how to care for it. But for now, let's commit ourselves to better soul awareness and better soul care. Let's rise up to the incredible gift of life we've been given. Let's make the most of this life Let's fill our account with the things that honor and please God. May we become good trees, deep souls, who love God and love others from the very depths of our innermost being. May God grant each of us a greater awareness of our souls. Come, Holy Spirit, take up your place alongside of our souls. Create in us a new thing, in accordance with the will of the Father in heaven. Make us fit for the kingdom work to which Jesus calls us. Raise up your church as a forest of good trees that please you and fulfill the purpose for which we have been called. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. As we come to the table, let's listen together to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. In sharing this communion together, we proclaim our union with Jesus, our fellowship with him, our communion with him in both his death and his resurrection. So as we do this, let's remember Jesus. Let's give thanks for the elements, and then we'll take them together. Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for all that he is, for all that he has done, for your great love which is poured out for each and every one of us through him. We thank you for his incredible sacrifice, we know, Lord, that he has taken upon himself all of our sin so that we could be blameless before you. That is such a gift. So we thank you for that. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would help us to live every day in light of that reality. Help us to live forgiven. Help us to live holy. Help us to live purposefully, just as Jesus would want us to do. We ask your blessing upon the elements of this communion as we remember Jesus, his broken body, and his new covenant in his blood as we share them together. In Jesus' name, amen. So take the bread, the body of Christ broken for you.
and now the cup. The new covenant in His blood for you. May God bless you. Join us after this gathering for prayer time on Zoom. And make sure that you check out forestbrook.ca forward slash summer before next weekend. So as we close this time on our soul care together, I pray that your soul would be refreshed by the one who is able. May you continue to find true rest in him alone. And may you draw near in friendship talking to Jesus. And oh, may your soul magnify God your Savior, for he has done great things. Amen. Thanks for being with us this morning and have a wonderful week.